you take our seats, please? Well, during the course of the first day, we heard the words 4chan and 8chan mentioned. References to the dark web were made, and fear that it was radicalising our rangatahi was voiced. There's no stretch to say that the fear is legitimate. Well, the role the internet plays in life is now front and centre of political debate. Facebook and Twitter are taking active roles in banning certain types of speech and information. But is that the solution to accusations of mis- and disinformation? Well, our facilitator Paul Ash is the Prime Minister's Special Representative on Cyber and Digital and the Cyber Coordinator based in the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. Paul works closely with the technology sector in cyber and digital agencies in New Zealand and globally, helping all of us grapple with the tough questions including what role do online environments, including social media and online algorithms, play in radicalisation? Please join me in welcoming Paul Ash to lead us through this next session. Kotohi it's a real um, privilege to be here today uh, to speak about a, a, a difficult topic in um, a hui that has um, had the internet um, a, a, as a pervasive theme. We heard a lot about it yesterday. This session is intended uh, to cover the online aspects um, of terrorism and violent extremism, including some, some really key questions for us. How the internet is abused for terrorism and violent extremism, what role online platforms play in radicalisation to violence, which has both online and offline drivers uh, and contributing factors. And I think we saw some really good examples of that yesterday. How, more importantly, we make positive change and preserve the good things about the internet. And, and, and a key question for us, I think, is, is the, um, um, attendees today uh, from Aotearoa in New Zealand, what does an internet for good look like in a New Zealand context when we're grappling with um, the difficulties of much of the content we see on it. And then we'll zero in on, on New Zealand and the role it plays on the global stage, uh, with a particular focus on the work of the Christchurch Corps. Just a, a few words by way of background. New Zealand, founded on a treaty partnership, is an open democratic society with unique foundations and um, grounding in its indigenous culture. We're geographically far from neighbours and from our friends. We cherish our connections with the outside world, uh, have done for uh, well over 800 years. And we make our living through openness and trade and have done over that time as well. These factors also influence how we think about the internet and why it's important for New Zealand. And they go to the core of New Zealand policy, which is that we want an internet that is free, open and secure and a place for constructive, constructive dialogue a place um, that enables us to connect with each other uh, and with global communities. That's underpinned much of the work we do in this area, including our membership of the Freedom Online Coalition. Unfortunately, and we'll hear a bit about, more about this today, in Christchurch we saw the more sinister side. The online environment is a place where a terrorist, a violent extremist, learned his craft. We found other racist and Islamophobic users to connect with and as a tool that he used to amplify uh, an atrocity that was uniquely made for the internet in a way that we'd never seen before. The Christchurch call was a key part of the response to that attack. Um, we heard the Prime Minister speak uh, about it yesterday. The call acknowledged that New Zealand had a voice 
uh, and an important role to play, um, a moral mandate, if you like, to galvanise change in how online platforms, governments and civil society jointly tackle this global problem. The call has made some important progress. Some of our panellists, I think, will speak to that. They've been intimately involved in much of that work. It also has work still to do. Uh, we're a long way from um, the vision of the call, uh, and there is critical work to do in understanding things like how algorithms may serve to radicalise um, the, the vulnerable, uh, how best um, communities and governments and online platforms might intervene in those um, radicalisation processes, and how to improve our transparency. Not just transparency for online platforms, but transparency for governments uh, and how we respond, and our crisis response. Beyond the, the horror of um, the online aspects of Christchurch attacks last year, uh, two years ago, we've also come to understand that social media can be a, a great enabler and give a voice to marginalised groups, and that sometimes those marginalised groups um, are... Um, um, need support and protection. Some of the other groups online uh, seek to use the internet to intimidate and silence. As a diverse, inclusive society, we need to be thinking very carefully about how we respond to that. And recently, um, and it may well come up today, it has certainly come up in conversations in recent weeks, we've seen very disturbing examples of people in New Zealand picking up the playbook used by white supremacists overseas uh, to target uh, not just uh, the Muslim community, uh, not just the familiar trope of that group of anti-Semitism, but to directly target uh, tangata whenua uh, and in some quite extraordinary ways. The cross-pollination of conspiracy theories with extreme misogyny, uh, with anti-LGBTQI plus commu um, communities, um, with hatred, with Islamophobia, with anti-Semitism and often eventually with violence represents a real risk to our society and social cohesion. It's, I think, really important to emphasise these things aren't simply the internet's fault. We heard a lot about the internet yesterday and I don't think much of it was particularly positive. When we're thinking about how to address this problem, it's actually important to keep in mind how the internet actually works. It's a global open architecture made of building blocks that interact in complex ways, governed by a system of multi-stakeholderism, not just by states. And in fact, when states seek to govern the internet alone, we tend to find we have significant problems and there's some temptations there that we need to manage carefully. It's also a system governed by shared responsibility where no one person has a definitive voice. So even as the New Zealand state has a responsibility for its citizens' safety, as Minister Little um, articulated last night, uh, and we've just heard um, from Minister Radhakrishnan as well, making decisions about uh, how we keep people safe online, um, making decisions about affecting change needs coalitions of people, communities of practice across the entire um, 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 span of those in Aotearoa New Zealand uh, to make that effective. We heard yesterday also um, the importance, I think, of the Treaty of Waitangi as a, as a founding document uh, and, and thinking about how we approach um, internet, um, internet issues and issues of violent extremism. And I think we saw yesterday, um, as we were grappling with some difficult issues, uh, some of those concepts of um, whakawhanaungatanga uh, and manakitanga, um, a cup of tea, can sometimes be much more than a cup of tea. And I guess one of the questions for the panellists as we think today is what does the cup of tea look like online? How do we create that space for difference and for uh, engagement where we have different perspectives? These are among some of the difficult issues our panel will discuss. It won't necessarily be comfortable. As one of the panellists said to me as we were putting the panel together, Paul, if you and your colleagues from the public sector are comfortable with what we have to say, we are not doing our job. And that's, um, in a sense, the wero we've accepted um, as, a, as a panel group uh, and I think as um, participants in today's hui. I will just say before we kick off, um, um, part of the very beginning of this process will be about showing, um, literally showing, some of the content that gives rise to real concern um, on, online. Um, for those um, who... Uh, 
Uh, we're not expecting that. I, I just want to make sure that you're aware that um, first, some of that may be triggering, uh, whether that's violent extremist content, whether it's actually some of the instances of um, its closest partners online these days of misogyny um, or hatred. Um, you know, the, the content can be quite disturbing and distressing. Now, I also know that many of you have been exposed um, to this content many times before. Um, please, if you do feel a need to step out, um, do so. Uh, there are wellbeing facilities uh, and support, and any of the team here can help direct you to that. The content is being shared in order to take this panel from one of abstract um, articulation of a problem uh, to being really solidly grounded in an understanding of what that looks like uh, before we then draw on a range of practitioners, scholars, um, folk from online um, platforms uh, and engage in the discussion around how to deal with it. So, look, I just wanted to lay that out beforehand, um, so please don't feel at all um, perturbed if you, if you do have some um, difficult reactions. Um, it's normal, we, 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 we know that in this field and um, we have facilities here uh, to assist. With that, I will stop speaking um, other than to introduce our first um, panellist this morning um, and say multi-stakeholder approaches involving civil society are fundamental to the work we do in this area. Anjum Rahman is an excellent example of someone who engages on some of these complex questions and brings a range of important perspectives to the debate. And I think it's great to have Anjum following on from this morning's presentation from others in the Islamic Women's Council. Anjum is a founding member of that council um, she is the project lead for Inclusive Aotearoa Tahono, a co-chair of the Christchurch Call Civil Society Advisory Network and a member of the Global Internet Forum to Counter-Terrorism's Independent Advisory Committee. Anjum, please. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Tēnā koutou katoa ko Anjum Rahman tuku ingoa. Um, thank you, Paul, uh, for the content note. That, uh, this material is definitely confronting. Uh, there is content that may be difficult for those who have had to deal with sexual violence and abuse, so please be prepared. Um, I'm putting forward this material because I think that it is important to see what communities and individuals are dealing with and because we all need to think about how we might tackle some of these issues, which are quite complex. Um, I'll just read this uh, beginning. Hapaitia te ara tika pumau ai te rangatiratanga mō nā uri whakatipu. Foster the pathway of knowledge to strength, independence and growth for future generations. So this first image is from the live stream that was um, done by the killer, and it was the camera was on his helmet. Um, that live stream has been banned in New Zealand, uh, but overseas media didn't take it down for quite a few days. Um, 1.5 million copies of this video was taken down by Facebook in the first 24 hours, but it is still available online. Uh, the chief censor, hi David, <laughs> deemed it objectionable material, which means that it uh, carries a jail sentence of, I think, up to 14 years. Um, and we've had, uh, it's, so that means it's a crime to own it, to view it, or to share it. And one person has, in fact, been jailed for sharing this video, Philip Arms, Arps, and he modified the video, adding his own commentary to it. ISIS videos, um, so these are videos that had defected, depicted beheadings um, and were extremely graphic. We have seen in this country young Muslim men who have been jailed for sharing these videos. Uh, big companies developed what they call a hash sharing database um, to prevent the sharing of these kinds of videos online and that was in place prior to the 15th of March attacks. And hashes should not be confused with hashtags, in case you don't know, they are a digital footprint, as it were, of each video. 
And the problem that we have with these hashes is that as soon as you modify the video, you add voice content, you add um, wording into, in, into the video, or e any changes, um, or you take parts, clips of the video, each of those things has its own unique hash. And so when you're trying to get down all the versions of the video, it's, it's quite a job. Um, one of the issues around the hash sharing database is around transparency. Who is making these decisions as to what material should be taken down um, and what shouldn't? And, you know, the question that we all have as a community to think about is whether we should leave these decisions for tech companies to make or should we leave them to governments? And we know that governments and censorship um, are not a good combination. And so my opinion is that we should have a statutorily independent body dealing with takedowns of this kind of material. Um, there were literally thousands of videos showing violent attacks in Syria, graphic videos uh, showing, you know, the, the results of, of terrible bombing. Um, in response to the live streaming of Christchurch Mosque attacks, YouTube took down literally thousands of these videos on the basis that they depict violence. The thing is that these videos document war crimes, crimes against humanity, um, and they alert the wider world to the kind of atrocities that have been happening in that country. Removal of those videos has meant loss of crucial evidence that could have been used to prosecute perpetrators of war crimes. Um, we've seen similar takedowns of videos during the uh, recent Gaza war. Um, now, death, explicit death and rape threats. On their own, this content wouldn't come under terrorist content. But the reason that I bring it up is because we know that there have been targeted online campaigns to silence women, and particularly women of colour. Um, I can name, you know, from back in the day, Anita Sarke uh, Sarkeesian, uh, Zoe Quinn, uh, who was, you know, targeted as part of the whole Gamergate thing, uh, Brianna Wu, these women had to leave their homes, uh, they had speeches at universities and other events cancelled because of bomb threats, um, and it is, you know, when we think about what do we call terrorism, when this is a targeted attempt to create fear and to silence and take people off platforms, um, you know, what do we do with it about that? And often we find that when we report these types of incidents, what you get is this stuff is taken down, but um, often, and I've heard from many women that get told, well, you shouldn't be engaging that way online, or you should, you know, asking them to reduce themselves online in order to not get attacks. And does that not sound familiar um, in terms of victim blaming? Um, we get also, so this is material that is not threatening. Nobody has threatened anyone with harm, but it is hateful material. And, and some of the stuff, it's the volume of it. And there is ample research to show that people of colour, women, LGBT communities are getting much more of this content than other people. Um, Leslie Jones, you know, talked about having to leave Twitter tonight with tears and a very sad heart. All of this because I did a movie. You can hate the movie, but the shit I got today was wrong. Okay, I've been called apes, sent pictures of their butts. Uh, even got a picture with, and I won't say because of, you know, the graphic content. Um, I'm trying to figure out what human means. I'm out. Um, that targeting of her, she was the black actress in the Ghostbusters film, um, was started by Milo Yiannopoulos, who was then banned from t Twitter because of this. But the purpose of these trolls is to remove the freedom of speech from these individuals. So when we talk about free speech, when we talk about protecting free speech, are we talking about protecting the speech of people like Leslie, or are we talking about protecting the speech of the people that target her? And you need to really be very carefully thinking when you make those free speech arguments, 
whose free speech you are protecting and whether that is the thing that you should be protecting. Um, these are um, actual commentary. I've been, I've been asked to take the names down. If it was up to me, I would leave those names up there and name and shame these people. Um, but actual commentary towards a mosque in Hamilton in uh, 2001. I'm still not sure, Martin, if this comes under NetSafe or not. Um, NetSafe deals with individual targeted harassment. Um, and this is not a threat to an individual. And also, while they say burn it down, they don't say, I will burn it down, and therefore, I've been told, doesn't come under the definition of a threat. Um, the, the New Zealand Against Sharia page has been taken down, the, the first page that shares the post has been taken down, but to this day, I don't know if the people that did this have been found, contacted, who they are, what they're doing. I know that that person had 14 in their URL, <coughs> they had 14 in their header, they were openly announcing they were Nazi, and their location said Hamilton, and you know, we don't know what happened, if anything. Um, and this kind of content, you know, and I'm going down a scale here, again, this kind of content um, is similar to the posters that were put up at Auckland University, um, with, which left students and staff feeling unsafe. They're not threatening violence, but they're feeding into an ideology that has led to violence. As well as the fact that psychological harm is a form of violence. So again, it, it's a question of how do we deal with this? What do we take down and how do we take it down? Um, I'm probably <laughs> getting to my time. I'll just quickly go through the three areas that I think <coughs> we need to be working on to deal with some of this kind of stuff. Um, for me, it, it always has to begin with te it, It's not just a founding document, it's a living document. It is what we have to live today, and it's about building an identity that reflects a power-sharing partnership and not in a superficial way. <coughs> I wish we'd had more from the session from Tangata Whenua yesterday, um, but also we should have had input from Tangata Whenua in every session. Um, we need more understanding between ethnic minority communities and, and tangata whenua. Um, but the thing is, when we start here, we begin to understand justice. We begin to push back on discrimination for all communities, and we bring a different set of values to this problem. I think the other thing for me, another thing that is really important, is about devolving power and understanding the complexity of communities. And that has to be understood at all levels. And we need that in leadership. We need that in participation to decision making, whether it's decision making on what gets taken down, what's legislation, what processes we have in place. We need to centre communities and start working across sectors um, and take the time that it needs, as well as giving the resourcing that it needs. And finally, um, I could, I could do uh, two hours on algorithms. Um, algorithms can be used um, to take down content because obviously the volume is so high um, and it's not possible for human beings to be sitting there taking down all of this content. Um, the recommendation engines, uh, they, when you click like on Facebook, when you click a website on your Google search, when you click on the sidebar of those videos that you watch on YouTube, the algorithm is sending you more and more of the stuff that you're clicking on. And so if you start getting into that path of, of um, extremist content, it gives you more and more of the same. And we see so many examples of people falling down that rabbit hole. Um, <coughs> the, the news feed, the searches, and also ads. Um, and so what a lot of people in civil society have been asking for is audits of these algorithms. And there is not audit of the code, but audit of the outcomes of these algorithms. Because again, there's a lot of research to show that algorithms are causing radicalization, they are having an impact in genocidal massacres. Um, and being an accountant, you know, I know about audits. And there is a whole 
infrastructure, around financial audits, around independence, confidentiality, sample testing, all of those things that could be, the principles could be applied to algorithmic audits that preserve um, the IP of tech companies and yet give us some level of assurance as to um, what the outcomes are and how much harm they're causing. And I just want to leave with a pretty picture because um, that was a bit of a difficult <laughs> uh, set of slides. Thank you. Um, our next speaker uh, is Nawab Osman, the Head of Counterterrorism and Dangerous Organisations at Facebook's um, Asia-Pacific team. Nawab has recently joined Facebook and begun working with us as part of the Christchurch Call uh, community, um, a piece of work that Facebook has been involved in since day one. I think we have Nawab coming to us on video screen. Is that all lined up and ready? Um, greetings, Nawab. Um, over to you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, real pleasure to be here amongst uh, my fellow panelists uh, and also to basically share some perspectives uh, around the issue of uh, violent extremism. Uh, I'm going to start basically looking at uh, some trends that we are observing in terms of how violent extremism has evolved uh, more recently. And then we'll move on to also look at, uh, you know, sort of the intervention both at the policy level as well as programmatic levels that uh, Facebook uh, have undertaken. Uh, and then, you know, I, I hope uh, to, to get a good discussion around some of the issues that Anjum uh, has actually highlighted. I think they are very important uh, issues. Uh, I, I pr in my previous uh, life, I was doing, I was a political scientist and, and I was doing a lot of work around issues of Islamophobia and anti-Muslim hate. Uh, and I think these are very important issues that need to be addressed. Now, um, when we are thinking of um, the issue of extremism, extremism or violent extremism is not a monolithic concept. Uh, there are numerous expressions of it. Uh, we are seeing, in fact, uh, newer variants or, you know, of, of violent extremism. A decade ago, for example, um, you know, the issue of far-right extremism uh, or for that matter, some form of religious-inspired uh, extremism, such as Hindu or Buddhist extremism, uh, would be something alien to most of us. Uh, but today, uh, more of more these issues are becoming more and more uh, important, and it's taking different forms. Um, where, while we were looking at uh, issues around the, the kind of violence perpetrated around some of the more uh, violent Islamist groups, uh, took uh, you know the forms of suicide bombing and so on. Today, uh, violent extremism can take the form of community uh, lynching of an individual by a, a group of people in, in a sustained and coordinated uh, manner. Uh, another issue or rather trend that uh, we, we are observing um, is the issue of, con of conspiracy theory networks. Uh, this was virtually non-existent, uh, but now we're seeing new groups that have emerged across the globe uh, partly accelerated by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, basically um, trying to influence people around around uh, a particular uh, notion of how things are, are like. Uh, one example of this is, of course, uh, the QAnon. Um, and at Facebook, what we have tried to do uh, is we have uh, announced, for, for instance, policies uh, last year around uh, the military, uh, militarized social movement and violence inducing conspiracy network uh, policies to deal with some of these newer forms of extremism. Um, a third sort of trend uh, that we, we observe uh, is a move away from larger platforms uh, like ours uh, to, to the use of smaller platforms. So increasingly, uh, we are seeing many of these groups, uh, some of them actually have done this on their own, uh, partly because of content removal, uh, partly because um, they, they are finding it difficult to use our platform to um, uh, sort of rally people around their ideology and messaging. Um, and, and of course, this speaks to a number, uh, there, there are a number of reasons for this, as I've said, uh, but part of it is really around the fact that a lot of our policies have been really effective at uh, rooting out bad content from our platform. 
Uh, we every quarter we release the community standard enforcement report, uh, and in the latest enforcement report, uh, we are happy to announce that more than 99.6 percent uh, of pieces of terrorism content uh, are proactively removed uh, through our uh, through both in human review as well as through our machine, uh, machine uh, algorithms and, and so on. And this is basically uh, content that we remove before any form of reporting. Now, policies alone, algorithms alone, um, machine learning alone, we feel uh, are not enough in terms of um, you know, how we deal with this issue of violent extremism. In fact, in a lot of ways, what we're seeing online is a reflection of real world uh, occurrences, real world developments, real world um, ideas that are uh, festering within certain communities. And a big part of what uh, we do at Facebook, and I'm, I'm basically doing a lot of work uh, around the issue of global, uh, around our policies, or rather programs around glo the global counter speech and countering violent extremism. Uh, and this, I think, is an important uh, area that uh, we are focused on. Now, uh, one pro program that uh, you know, I, I'm uh, sort of looking at is a program called Search Redirect. Um, basically, the whole idea of, of redirect is that is a concept of diminishing access to extremist uh, content and mitigating radicalization by creating access barriers to extremist propaganda. So basically, this entails when someone uh, is to uh, search for certain keywords associated with uh, extremism and terrorism, uh, to especially to at-risk audiences. Uh, that we would have certain product interventions to create barriers to such content. Uh, so currently, uh, we have uh, this program, Search Redirect, in about four markets, the United States, Germany, Australia, and Indonesia, where we develop together with uh, local CSO, civil society organization partners, uh, to develop um, the search terms and to also develop uh, material and helplines and so on uh, for people who are at risk at being radicalized. Uh, radicalized. Uh, and another important uh, initiative that we have undertaken, and we believe that uh, the community cohesion in particular is extremely important in the work uh, uh, to prevent violent extremism. And it is important that we empower communities, we empower uh, community leaders, CSOs, um, and other actors uh, in, in the space uh, to essentially build trust um, in terms of getting to communities that we might actually have problems reaching out to that are susceptible to uh, radical ideas and so on. And uh, one such initiative is a partnership that we have with the Asia Foundation in APAC, uh, where we uh, bring together about 65 civil society organizations from about 10 different countries, and, and we are expanding this to, to a number of other countries within the region. Uh, to essentially uh, empower, uh, train, provide resources uh, to CSOs that are working in the space of building cohesion, uh, countering violent extremism, um, count, uh, uh, peace building in conflictual uh, areas, uh, to essentially show our commitment uh, that this, this issue of violent extremism is one that requires partnership with multiple uh, actors, especially in civil society uh, organizations. Now, I'm going to end there. Uh, I know I have about six minutes, uh, so I don't want to take too much time so that we can have more time for discussion. So I'm going to end there. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Nawab. Um, very helpful to have that contribution from one of the platforms. We have another uh, speaking later. Our next speaker is Sanjana Hatatua. Sanjana is a PhD candidate in the Centre for Peace and Conflict Studies at Otago University and a special advisor to the ICT for Peace Foundation in Geneva. Sanjana has worked for a, a long time on social media's complicated relationship with democracy and advocacy all around the world. Sanjana. Thank you very much. Um, I joked with Manisha from DPMC that the only South Asian on a panel is possibly because somebody realized there's a checkbox to be ticked, or uh, I have a joke to be uh, articulated, or that South Asian is the joke. Um, so I hope to be, if not enlightening, then entertaining. 
Um, Manisha, you know, the joke didn't go well. Like, you know, <laughs> yes, it. <laughs> Um, and uh, maybe bring a broader perspective to the discussions that we've had over the past one and a half days. I did want to start with a brief reference to the chair's opening remarks uh, that have been articulated yesterday as well. Let me put it very bluntly, the articulation and the definition of the problem that New Zealand and Aotearoa is geographically very far removed from the rest of the world isn't going to cut uh, any ice it's not going to inoculate you against the threats and the risks that are what the UN calls frontier issues that are going to be front door issues. So your geographic isolation is not going to help too much in the future. Um, the chair also mentioned the recent examples of anti-Maori sentiment and anti-minority sentiments and those of this color and those of Maori and Samoan descent in this audience know that this is not recent. It is systemic. It is not a bug, it is a feature. And that is what I think we need to really address and tackle head on. So the recent examples are articulations and peaks uh, of a more systemic uh, injustice that now has digital resonance as well. And finally, the chair said that uh, there is no one definitive voice on the internet and again, to um, you know, riff off my last point, um, you know, we heard Facebook, we will hear from Twitter. There are definitive voices. That's what bloody algorithm, algorithms are all about. Um, it is not a democratic space. People of color, people who are not of the G7, people who are not from the OECD, people who are not Pakeha and from Aotearoa, people with a Sri Lankan passport trying to get into Aotearoa, we are not really on par with the power structures that govern the internet. So to suggest that there is no definitive voice, I think is a fiction that needs to be questioned as well. Power, identity, language, gender, location, community, context, trust, these are all things that affect our consideration. And that is what the slide is all about and my presentation will briefly touch on, which is to take an ecological, ecosystems-based perspective around what binds us together and what can also drive us apart. And in a sense, the language that I'm going to use is now more familiar on account of COVID-19, because for the data scientists in the room, uh, it is almost very similar to what we would study uh, social networks uh, with. Um, the point about, uh, and I will use some of my photography as well, this is uh, from Lake Wanaka. Um, I've found that trees in winter are almost incredibly like the synaptic connections in our brain. And that is important uh, because those like Kate and I and others in the room who study disinformation, we really are wired differently. Um, we see the world differently because we study it at a scale and scope that is rather different to studying individual pieces of content. Uh, and my submission is that um, one of the ways in which um, we have to address this issue of disinformation is to get away from academic and policy languages and discourses into discourses that really ground our conversations in everyday language so that people understand that they are very much part of the problem and also part of the solution as well. Uh, and you know, while graphs and charts and data visualizations look very cool, uh, I think that that's not really helpful in a policy perspective uh, around this issue. Um, I come from two decades of work uh, in a country from Sri Lanka. I came here to do my PhD studies that is by order of magnitude, every single day and at every single touch point, more violent than our Aotearoa is and has been, including the events of March two years ago. It is a degree of violence that is embodied and negotiated daily defies your imagination because you simply haven't experienced it. And it is far worse, by the way, for minorities in my country and, uh, and women and people from the LGBTIQ plus communities. It's very violent. And it is the negotiation of this violence that I, you know, you can't probably see the slide from at least the front of the room, those at the back may be able to see it better. But I would articulate a perspective that very often our disinformation discourse is linked to episodic moments and what is observable and can be responded to in the short term. 
my long gaze in study uh, suggests and recommends a perspective that looks at uh, the individual, the disinformation entrepreneurs and the disinformation innovation, if you were to see it that way, uh, who are beyond uh, immediately observable parameters, whether we come from government and policy or academia, and have a very long-term gaze. Their intended outcome is a decade or more into the future. Whereas our regulatory and policy perspectives are very often linked to the lifespan of a government or the incumbent in power uh, or what we can uh, immediately respond to and react to in terms of a stochastic terrorist incident. So there's a temporal disconnect in how those who seek to harm, hurt, and eviscerate or evaporate our Terroa New Zealand's democratic fiber see the future and how policymakers try to, in a regulatory and policymaking perspective, address it. That temporal disconnect, I think, requires further reflection. This is from Craters of the Moon in uh, Rotorua, which I had the fortune to visit. And it suggests to me what was articulated yesterday as well, where if you're not sensitive to what is the firmament, uh, the earth, and only respond to what you can see, you're not probably going to do a very good job at addressing this information. Uh, those of you who have been here know that this is geothermal energy. And the quote there is from the person who was uh, tasked with looking at challengers, the Challenger Space Shuttle's disaster in 1986. And the point is a very simple one and may escape uh, those in our terroir. The enemies are going to come from within us. I have heard uh, the almost comfort taken that the perpetrator who shall not be named from two years ago was not one of us. That is going to change. The perpetrators in the future are going to come from here in our terroir. What are you going to do then? What is the discourse you're going to have then? The whole point of this information is that it turns liberal democracy on its head and the normative assumptions and foundations of what you value and creates enemies and a disconnect from family, immediate family, whenua, your colleagues, your community, who are then, over time, the progenitors and producers of this information. That's a very hard thing for most in the room to grasp. But I know this from disinformation in other contexts, over five continents, 60 countries, and 20 years. The virus very quickly becomes part of and integral to society and cannot be called alien, foreign, or outsiders anymore, which is why an ecological perspective is useful. When I have gone to a DOC park, the park doesn't ask my political affiliation or what religion I worship or what my gender is. It is salubrious to everybody who goes. What you're looking at there is on those slides, this is from Dunedin's uh, Botanical Gardens, is essentially regulation. That is your TSA. That is what the New Zealand chief censor will have to do. Uh, how to prune, how to cut, what is the sunlight, what is the topsoil, what is, is it alluvial, what are the wellsprings that fuel and nurture the trees, what kind of trees grow, what kind of trees are compatible, how should we grow them, what are the organic uh, uh, ways in which we can uh, harmoniously create an ecosystem that is healthy, uh, so artists call this chiaroscuro, the interplay of light and darkness. That is society. This is regulation. How do you increase the light, the God rays, if you will, and how do you address the darkness? An ecological perspective changes the vocabulary of the conversations we are having around disinformation and grounds it not just amongst a large amount of people, but changes the lens we use to look at disinformation taking it away from the technocratic and the technological into what is essentially a socio-technological and socio-economic framing. That is important. That is also linked to this slide, which is technically called murmuration, but it's called swarms. You see this in fish, you see this in birds. When disinformation is studied at scale, like Kate and I do, this is what you will see. And I'm talking in the tens of millions. I look at 21 million records on a given week on Facebook alone, and I look at around 200,000 tweets on a good week uh, per week uh, uh, on, on, on Twitter. That's the scale we are looking at. 
And when you see it at this scale, you see communities responding to certain things, not unlike the way birds flock and shoals of fish move. Now, what is not known here is that, well, it's not really known why the birds move this way. We haven't an, uh, an explanation, but um, physics tells us that there are three principles that govern movement here. Addition, how do you attract? Cohesion, how do you keep together? And repulsion, how do you uh, stay apart? These are the principles of social cohesion. So you would have belonging, inclusion, participation, recognition, and legitimacy. But when you look at disinformation at scale, it's not unlike the beauty of these birds coming together. And the trick is, how do you understand how disinformation entrepreneurs do this? And then how do you turn it on its head? And how do you get a democratic society and a socially cohesive society to act in this manner? Very often, by the way, these birds are reacting to an eagle, which is not pictured. So the collective community responds to a threat, uh, and it's a collective response. Um, the imagination is important. These are my final slides. Um, we need to be imaginative and imagine new communities. And how do you do that? This is Thomas Wright from centuries ago. It's a Google book. It's beautiful. It's beautiful for the plates it's used. I, I love aesthetic design, and I love printing and the evolution of printing. Um, Wright was a self-taught astronomer and a gardener and loved good design. So this is from 1750. And by the way, Wright was the first person to talk about a spiral universe. He imagined something that we now know through Hubble to be true. And so how do we imagine a community in our terroir uh, like Wright would have imagined the universe? This is uh, of doubtful sounds on a cruise that I took. And I think that's really important. What makes our terroir our terroir? What is sui generis about it? And again, from the long arc of five continents and 60 countries, including the Balkans, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and both sides of the Atlantic, there is something unique about the country that, that I've called my country for the past three years. What is that? Is it for me to articulate? Is it for you to enunciate? Who gets a voice in its definition? Um, very often, um, what I have found is that uh, there is an articulation and a capture of the country uh, by a select group of people. And should we expand that uh, as our inoculation against disinformation? So I leave with three thoughts. One is that the long arc of my journey, and I've not used the academic language, I've not used policy language, I've not used technology language. I have interacted with all three and civil society on a sustained basis, but I have opted not to use it and extrapolate from my experience things that may resonate more from an ecological perspective. There is something unique about our Terawa New Zealand. It is responding to these discussions in a way that no other country talking about disinformation has or can. That is something that you have at the moment that is precious but may not last for long. Number two, what are your values? Rights as roots, and that session on Maori is fundamental to what I think. And by the way, in your dockets, you have a great articulation of this in a paper I've written to which this presentation complements. Uh, Maori, or what we in South Asia call Adivasi, which is roughly translated to First Nation principles around time, community, land, identity, future, present, belonging, context, culture, and country, are fundamental ingredients in how policy, regulation, technology, and algorithmic lenses address disinformation. You cannot divorce it. And should you do, choose to do so, you will fail. The Maori perspective must be center and forward. And I end by a favorite poem and poet of mine, uh, James Baxter, who wrote, about, who, who wrote this poem, New Zealand. And I quote, as one who has buried his dead, able at last to give with an open hand. Communities in Christchurch have lost so much, not just in March, by the way, but on account of seismic activity. And if we can extrapolate from that loss that this city, this council knows only too well, and if this audience and policymakers in this country can accept with open heart 
the generosity of what those who have lost so much have to give. I think we don't need a technocratic debate. We have the answers to disinformation right here in our terror. I thank you very much. Thank you much, so much, Sanjana. And I've, I've let some of the presentations go on because I think um, there are some extraordinary perspectives um, being offered here. Um, we have now um, a um, colleague, someone we've worked very closely with from Twitter, Nick Pickles, who is the Director of Global Public Policy and Strategy Development there. He's been closely engaged in efforts to um, work on counterterrorism and violent extremism through the call, but also since well before it. Uh, he comes from a background um, of civil society work. Um, with Big Brother Watch and the United Kingdom um, before uh, his time with Twitter, so is uniquely placed to give us uh, some thoughtful and useful perspectives. And I think Nick will also be joining us by video uh, from the US. Welcome, Nick. So, firstly, let me just say um, how grateful we are to be uh, to join you all uh, and how sorry I, I am that I can't be there and uh, sharing a cup of tea. Um, I think. Um, as a Brit, there's not many problems you can't solve that start with sitting down and having a cup of tea together. Uh, and so I hope before too long uh, we can join uh, and all be together. The, the questions that this series grappling with um, are so fundamental to the future of the internet. I, I don't want to uh, take the time today uh, to talk about uh, Twitter's policies and talk about um, uh, the, the things that we've done over the years. We can uh, discuss that in questions. I, just, I want to offer some thoughts, um, hopefully some, some provocations on how we start solving the challenges that Anjum and Sanjana have both outlined um, so, so brilliantly. The, the future of the open internet is going to be more diverse than it is today. There's a billion people to come online. The services that exist today are not the services that will exist in 10, 20, and 30 years time. The internet will be more decentralized. The internet will give more control to people to shape their own experiences. And I think as Anjum rightly highlighted, the question of algorithmic impact on people's lives is one of the defining questions of the modern era of technology and how we address these questions and how we, we solve the problems. And also we solve the problems that the solutions create. One of the, the great challenges in this space is that often one intervention creates other issues, some foreseen, some unforeseen. So I think this HUI is a unique opportunity to, to try and see into the future, uh, identify shared opportunities to work together, and then to actually build solutions that work. When I, when I first joined Twitter, uh, we used to say that technology was a mirror uh, and that technology was reflecting society. But I, I don't think that's true anymore. I think, I think technology refracts the image. It's still a reflection, but the technology does change it. We've already heard the impact that algorithms have that do amplify and privilege certain voices, certain cultures, certain uh, identities. And how we make sure the internet is a place where people can express themselves. And as we've already heard, not a place where they can be silenced by the mob. Free expression means nothing if the most vulnerable in society cannot express themselves. And I think, um, as we've already heard, that question of free expression sometimes fails to recognize the people who self-censor, the people who cannot bring their full selves to a conversation. And so as we look to the future of the internet, the ability of everyone to participate in the public conversation is something we have to stay rooted to as a, a foundational principle. We also have to ask some, some really hard questions about ourselves uh, and about society. Content moderation isn't going to solve these problems alone. If we remove hate from one platform, Often that hate moves to another smaller platform. It moves to a private space. It moves to somewhere that's less governed. And at the same time, there is speech that will always be difficult, that will be challenging, that goes to the root of the kind of societal tension that takes decades to work through. And many of the equality movements and movements for justice globally have often started with a very painful uh, demonstration of the division in society that exists. There's also going to be a challenge that a society without violence 
won't be built on a society without offence and that causing offence and that difficult speech is something that goes hand in hand with a democratic open society. So how we resolve these tensions and how we develop solutions that protect participation, but at the same time address and uh, hopefully prevent violence is critical. These are the kind of issues that play out every day at Twitter. Our policies evolve because behavior changes. Um, over my time at Twitter, we've had to revisit a number of policies because bad actors will change their behavior to try and get around our policies. We see new behaviors that we hadn't foreseen uh, and the use of technology that may at one time seem innocent in very harmful ways, be that emojis, or even indeed some people attempting to use animated GIFs um, as a way of targeting people who have epilepsy. Those kinds of real life experiences that people see online are things that uh, in many cases weren't foreseen, in some cases should have been foreseen, and in other cases, um, uh, more patience uh, and more outreach would have helped develop solutions to prevent that harm. We also need to understand what different interventions are possible. Uh, three or four years ago, the discussion was primarily content moderation means removal of content or do nothing. There's actually now a far greater range of interventions that you can take. It might be limiting the algorithmic uh, amplification of content. It might be warning labels. It might be placing um, accounts into a restricted state so their engagement is limited uh, and people can't retweet or like the content but the content exists to allow public discussion and accountability. So how do we solve these questions going forward? Sanjana has always, always used this word, and I think it's so critical, is an ecosystem approach. More than ever before, media moves from traditional media to social media, to private spaces, to real world conversations, and then back again. And we end up having different versions of the same conversation in different places. And there are different people who influence those conversations in different ways, and we have to engage all of them. And I think one of the, uh, one of the most troubling uh, statistics for me about the events of March were the fact that two thirds of people who saw the video on Twitter saw it because it had been posted by a verified account, many of whom were news organizations. That requires some really hard conversations about balancing the freedom of the press an essential part of a free and democratic society with ensuring that propagandizing and spreading the message of those who seek to do society harm isn't part of that coverage. The Huey also reminds us that we have shared challenges and the need for a societal shared response. And one of the things I'm looking for today is hearing from, from everyone there about how Twitter can continue to play a bigger role in those responses. And that's why one of the things the Christchurch call has done so transformatively is that multi-stakeholder approach. In my time in civil society and in industry, I've never been involved in a process where the, the, the voices at the table are of equal standing and are able to bring different perspectives in a shared environment. That's not normal. Many of the policy conversations I'm part of take place behind closed doors without civil society involved, without academia there to provide insights and data to drive solutions that work in the real world. And so that ethos of multi-stakeholderism is something that um, the New Zealand government has led globally, and I'm very, very grateful to continue participating in. I actually, after, after this, this, this intervention and, and the remarks, I'm still an optimist. One of the exciting things about technology is that there are more ways to reach people with a message of hope, with a message of optimism. Technology allows us to have more conversations with people and reach across those ideological, cultural, and identity divides and speak to people. And the basis of all, all the future hopes that we have being in human interaction with one another is something that technology can facilitate. The tools are there, the policies are hard, and the trade-offs are real. But I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be part of this here today and look forward to the conversation and the questions going forward. Sure, no, thank you, Nick. Um, following on from that, we will have a New Zealand perspective from Jordan Carter. Jordan is the chief executive of Internet NZ, the operator of the .NZ domain space, and a not-for-profit organisation committed to keeping the internet open and secure for New Zealanders. Jordan brings a wealth of experience in internet governance and online policy issues, as well as um, with his organisation having played a crucial role in the Christchurch call. 
both as a convener of civil society in its early stages and on an ongoing basis as part of the community of experts contributing to the work. Jordan. Ooh, big audience. Um, kia ora koutou katoa, uh, ko Jordan Carter tōkou ingoa, um, and aslam alaikum. Um, I join with others uh, to pay my respects to the survivors and families of the Shuhada here in Christchurch. Um, I found this whole um, seminar hui so far incredibly thought-provoking, so I want to start off with a couple of general comments and then get into some nitty-gritty bearing in mind that I want to hear from you and we're, we're well over time with our speakers already, so I don't know how I'll juggle that. But um, thank you for all the perspectives that have been shared. The first observation is that the technology that we're talking about, and I'm focused mainly on the online experience here, um, is in a way amplifying and worsening problems that already exist in our society. And those problems in this society are founded on white supremacy. You cannot ignore that, and people like me and there are quite a few of us in the room have got work to do on that front. Um, the vision that has been coming through in various contributions about the founding role of Chatiriti in building a different society founded on values like Manakitanga is, I think, the essence of where we could go and is the essence of why our country's voice can play a role that's outsized of our, our scale and our size in these global debates. So I think I want to come back to that. Um, and it follows there that doing policy and doing this work has to involve dialogue like this and the deep listening that was spoken of yesterday. Everyone here probably has been part of a, a normal policy process. The tick box of consultation, the asking people who are experiencing the problems to develop the solutions, you know, that, that model is for the birds. It cannot be the way that we tackle these problems because it asks too much and gives too little, and it does not solve the problems. It leads to lapses into tokenistic responses, or it leads to people saying, this is not my problem, why don't you solve it for me? Um, and that is a problem with technology, because this internet stuff is woven so deeply these days into the fabric of our society, that on the one hand, I want to say that asking tech to solve tech's problems is never going to work. And that is not an abnegation of responsibility that the tech sector has, but it's simply saying that as a sector we do not know enough. We cannot have enough perspective to actually really understand the problems and then really be moving to solve them. The technology is almost what flows from that broader understanding that we need. Um, and in doing that, we can't avoid the elephants, the, the number of elephants in the room, the big platforms, right? Because a lot of the harm that we're talking about, a lot of the processes that happen, the scale of the audience and the interaction is part of what really matters. You know, there are the problems of the small platforms, but I think the big propagation impacts, the big journeys towards extremism are often happening in these bigger spaces. Um, and them deciding how to deal with that problem by themselves simply isn't tenable. So I want to sort of focus on four main points. One is that in this debate about the internet, who here uses the internet every day? Just put your hands up. Who here often finds it useful? Yeah, this is the dilemma, right? This is a, an amazingly powerful set of technologies and communications. And the work we need to do is hard precisely because we want to protect those opportunities and good points and mitigate the harms. The old days of, oh, the tech is just the tech, you know, what people do with it, it doesn't matter, is, is, is well past its use by date. But we do have to act in ways which is helped by careful deliberation that can keep the benefits and mitigate the harms. And Anjum talked about some of those examples of the flip sides of moderation and so on. Um, and so good information is at the core of this. Much greater transparency and insight from the platforms, the data that's provided, so that all of us can actually analyze and really understand what the real problems are, not the problems that we reckon might be happening, really grounded in the experience of, of the communities who are facing the most risks here. Um, because TBEC terrorist violence treatment content is just part of a spectrum. It doesn't exist on its own, and it doesn't exist just in the online world. One of the most ridiculous um, things I've heard in any discussions about this actually happened in a forum in Wellington where someone tried to use the old analogy of sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me, as if that was an excuse to say that 
this whole freedom of expression crap needed to be at the forefront of these debates. It does not. Words do hurt, and words motivate people to kill. And we cannot forget that as a society in dealing with these issues. And so there are many gaps that we have to close in the content regulation environment, because that's part of it. Between services, governments, and local communities working together, um, between the government agencies in the legislative frameworks, the idea that the online safety system in New Zealand has gaps that leave people exposed and not supported, some of the examples, again, that Andrew brought to the fore, the fact that content moderation is often done either by algorithms or by people who are simply not here. If we're going to have moderation, we need people here in our society, in our context, making those decisions. And deciding where responsibility lies for the content that's put on these platforms. When are we responsible as individuals for what we post? When is it moving into the publication or media environment? And it isn't just about content. You know, there's the whole, and it isn't about just about content and regulation. The, the question of amplification and distribution is essential. And um, the creation of good information that people can trust and the counter narratives that we need. Um, the transparency I've already talked about, the market power of the big players in these information ecosystems. All of this needs to be on the table because you can't solve the big picture by just focusing on the regulatory side of things. Um, and I want to come back to that point that, that this has to be grounded in the experience of people who are, are facing the biggest challenges here. The internet works well most of the time for many people, but it, it is not working well for some communities. And sorting things out for those communities based on the lived experience that we can share with them and learn from is the way to make it better for everyone. You know, this might sound horribly instrumental, but no one is going to be worse off by making the internet better for everyone. So there are, there are no downsides here except the effort and the, the pulling off of blinkers that some of us need to engage with to actually do that. So if I come right quickly back to a summary, we need to improve our knowledge and understanding of the system as a whole. We need to be closing the gaps of regulation and support so that when bad things happen, people face you know, the, the obligations that they need if they're providing these platforms and the support that they desire and deserve as citizens in Aotearoa. And processes to do that that appropriately seek and act on the input of these communities. You know, um, when you come right back to this, shortly after what happened in March, there's that um, image on Instagram that, that Ruby Jones did. And it said, this is your home and you should have been safe here. That doesn't just apply to our physical communities, it applies to our online world as well. And the tech sector can't do it alone, but together with dialogue like this, I know that we can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Um, our last speaker um, this morning uh, is Kate Hanna. Kate's the project lead for the Disinformation Project at Te Punaha Matatini, a research centre devoted to the study of complex systems. And we've already seen a very good graphic description of what a complex system looks like from Sanjana. She's also been engaged as a New Zealand contributor to the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence. And as a humanities scholar working in Auckland University's physics department, um, and those, grabbing those two things and holding them together is actually really interesting for this work. Kate's work has great resonance with the complexity that we see in society and the internet. Kate. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, it's great just when you say you're a historian in the physics department. That usually confuses everybody. Namahi nui kia koutou. No Wales, Scotland, Gloucestershire, Dorset, O. Ko Innes Mon te Motu, Ko Minator te Maunga, No Hughes, Mackenzie, Appley, Edmonds, Aho, Ko Kate Hanna, Toku Ingoa. Mein Durg, Genef, En Ek Al Goleg. For each of those who are lost, to all of those who are harmed, to all the families whose tables are missing a loved one, I'm here in Opeltahi to work with you, and Opeltahi, I'm here to be useful nothing else. Um, let me start with a quote from Alan Kurnow's Landfall and Unknown Seas, which was written in 1942. The sailor lives and stands beside us, paying out into time's wave the stain of blood that writes an island story. The stain of blood that writes an island story has at its heart an image of imperialism. The imperial project rolled out from Europe over centuries, 
and formed and shaped by the doctrine of discovery is the foundation of the structures and systems of New Zealand. These underlying and frequently invisibilized structures, imperialism, colonization, white supremacism, misogyny, Islamophobia, homophobia, anti-Semitism, they also underpin the human and technical features of life online. The digital world reflects the structural and systemic violences towards the other that form the basis of the physical world we all inhabit. Online harm, hateful or violent expression and actions, and disinformation are global issues. And like all other global issues, they are shaped innately by imperialism. And their effects are not experienced evenly in communities, within societies, or between nations. And really critically here, their impacts are most felt within communities which have experienced the most significant effects of that imperial project. Here in Aotearoa, communities targeted with harmful content and hateful or violent expression and, and action include Māori, Pacifica diaspora communities, Muslim communities, Chinese diaspora communities, refugee and migrant communities, LGBTQIA plus communities, particularly trans communities, and peoples living with the experience of disabilities. These communities within Aotearoa are also the target of much of the disinformation present in both national and transnational information ecosystems. And also alternatively, they often become the focus of disinformation presented to others, largely Pākehā or white migrant communities. So these patterns that we see through the research of online harm targeting indigenous youth, of hateful and violent expression and action targeting Muslim women, of disinformation addressing directly minoritized communities' experiences of violent state interventions, and then of these communities themselves being blamed for current social and political turmoil, they're global. Um, Sara Ahmed describes um, in her work on harassment um, in institutions how the complainant becomes the problem when we call out and note institutional injustices. Um, we become bothersome when we make the complaint. Um, this plays out constantly online in the framing of harm, hate, and the potential for violence. Those who report, or in often cases try to report, become the problem. They are blamed for drawing attention to the invisible structures of violence that are constantly present. Um, so Aotearoa New Zealand is not unaffected by these global patterns. And, and increasingly what we're seeing um, through these, um, there, are, there are attempts going on right now in New Zealand to reassess and revise understandings of the impacts of colonisation, the imperial project, and beginnings of the realisation of justice um, in the framework of te tiriti. And those discourses are being intentionally framed online as sites of national controversy, as, as sites for a culture war to take place. Um, from Black Lives Matter to Me Too, Notions of radicalization and companion words we've heard mentioned frequently, like extremism and polarization, are highly contestable and manipulatable. Nearly every past justice movement which has secured a more equal and more representative social democracy has involved language and acts which could have or could still be described as radical, extremist, and polarizing. Discourse about our safety here in this space in the last two days um, further reveal these competing narratives. Here now in Aotearoa, New Zealand, who is the our whose safety and security is at threat? The internet, which is the tools and technologies which form this digital world, has been handmade by machine. Um, it, it encompasses all of the things that are wrong with our present society. Um, it's a contradiction, Jordan's talked about um, free and open internets, but I always have to ask, who is it free and open for? By whom was it made? And in whose interests is it so? So for me, the heart of the matter is not the byline of this panel. Online violent and hateful extremism are features of the foundational and ongoing effects of the imperial project on human cultures and societies. The digital world enables these ideas, some of which are ancient and some which are newly developed, to be shared really easily. And then the technical mechanics of things like recommender algorithms, parameterization, 
content feeds and, and the ever um, important idea of engagement increase what we call the volume and reach of these hateful and violent ideas, expressions, images, languages and memes. Um, and Anjum very clearly showed, there's no need for me to have slides to show the sort of stuff I come across in my work because Anjum showed that. Right now in Aotearoa, New Zealand, that hateful and violent expression and, and action is targeting a number of communities in both digital and physical worlds. And we've had some mention of that over the last two days. It is specifically white supremacist, misogynistic and transphobic. Those who it seeks to attract sympathy from, radicalise if you want to use that word, are Pākehā or white migrant communities. Through placing, as Sarah described yesterday, real or imagined personal grievances within a political framework of racist hate. That kind of material and artefact, which I study, makes its way through other discourses, is discussed in the media and by politicians, by academics and thought leaders and civil society organisations, and in this manner um, sometimes becomes normalised and legitimised as a topic of discussion. Um, the movement of ideas and themes back and forth through and across digital and physical social networks and via individuals and group narrators enables the development of what we increasingly see as a contestable space, um, language and narrative and ideas which nearly meet existing criteria for objectionable or harmful or hateful, but which are purposefully playing in a space that doesn't quite get there. They're intentionally designing their words in that manner. Um, we've been asked to offer some practical solutions. I, it's quite humorous to me as a cultural historian to think I might have something practical to offer, <laughs> apart from reflections on the past. Um, but for Aotearoa New Zealand, the realisation of the partnership uh, we are provided in Te Tiriti o Waitangi is absolutely central for making any kind of positive change for all New Zealanders in both digital and physical worlds. And this has to start with a reckoning about the fundamental and ongoing impacts of the imperial project. And elements of this are underway. As a historian, um, the, the review of the history curriculum um, is very much an important piece of this reckoning. Um, but it will start from the margins and not the centres. I'm going to conclude and, and humour me um, with reading a poem by my friend uh, and writer and poet, academic Alex Tapunga Somerville. Um, she wrote this for her talk, uh, which was supposed to be given, she gave a talk in May 2021 uh, as the Michael King lecture as part of the Writers Festival in Auckland, a talk entitled Too Many Cooks. Um, but she ran out of time to read this poem and I'm going to read it now. It's a poem which imagines a shared future. There are Captain Cooks amongst us too, bullies throwing their weight around. They think they are at the centre of the room, but that's only because they've never been anywhere but there. They have no idea about the edges or even how far the room extends. One day, they will realise that we in the corners are really in, are in other centres. They will realise there are no corners, no walls. Is it a room? Is it a room then when there are no walls? I used to want to tell them to move over because they take up all the room. But there's no room. There is no room. No walls, no room, just links and connections and space. You're not at the centre. There are no centres. You're just standing there, one node in a massive network like the rest of us.